Well, how'd you do last week with last week's application? Uh, if you forgot all about it, let me give you a little reminder. If you forgot all about it, then I guess you weren't applying it. But again, take these things down. Uh, we can see this. First, on a scale of 1 to 10, where would you rate your fervency for Christ? If Paul would meet you and visit uh, for a while, would he be apt to ask you if you received the Holy Spirit? Uh, that whole thing, if the Spirit flowing forth from your life like a torrent of living water. And again, you can get last week's message. Uh, and would you like a new dynamic life in a, in a Christian life? And how we're going to do that, again, is by asking the Father. Because he's going to give good gifts to those who ask him. And so for some of you, you prayed for the first time for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you got that. Well, would you let me know? Because the Bible says to share all good things with your teacher your teacher. So let me know what's, what happened in your life this week, what's going on with that. And then... Jesus said, if the earthly father said, if you know how to give good gifts, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask them? So let's go with this to, uh, to uh, Acts uh, chapter 20. Uh, we'll pick it up at uh, verse, uh, verse 1. Well, get your little sights right here. Look where all stuff like that. So again, the Paul is traveling and going through these very cities, get that mind's eye, because again, uh, chapter 20 is going to read really fast. And they didn't just do this and hop in a car and do this in just a few hours, all right? So there's some time involved with this. Look at the whole known Roman Empire at that time. That's in red. Uh, we see that all the way from Rome. We're going to see that the Apostle Paul later, after Acts chapter 20, is going to go. Is going to be, uh, he, he's desired to go to Rome. Understand that. He just didn't desire to go the way he's going to be, end up going to Rome, but he's, he's going to get there nonetheless. And so Acts chapter 20, verse 1. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto his disciples and embraced them and departed for, uh, uh, for to go into Macedonia. And again, when you look at that map, this is verses uh, 1 through um, uh, 6 there. Going into Macedonia, he wants to go to Syria. We talked about this last week. Well, I talked, you listened. Uh, and, he's one of the, and so he was going to try to route and take a ship all the way back. But instead, he hears this plot that's going to go on. He says, I'm going to go through Macedonia. Macedonia is in existence today. It used to be all known of Greece at that time, but Macedonia is just north and just above Greece. It's still a country today, by the way, folks. But uh, then he's going to drop down into Greece and in Taurus, and uh, he's going to be hooking up with some folks there. So again, we can see right through here. Uh, here's Corinth. Here's Acacia. We know where Greece is, and just above that is Macedonia. We can see that whole region that's uh, going in there if you look at the maps there. Again, you look at the, uh, uh, hopefully it's a little bit better map, but you can see it here. But again, uh, this little orange line here, that's going to be his trip to Rome here. So now here's Athens, here's Corinth. Up there's Macedonia. He's going, going through there. He finds out the plot. Look at these countries, right, or these cities right there. Um, he understands the spot says, hey, I'm going to take another route instead of just getting right back to uh, Jerusalem that way. He's trying to make it back for the feast there. And so, again, you look at these various maps here. Look at verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. I think I talk long, huh? He's there. And there was uh, many lights in the upper uh, chamber, and they were gathered together. And there sat in the window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. That's about his preaching, huh? And as Paul was long preaching... He sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down. Listen, kids, don't be falling asleep. I know it's a short trip here, but don't be, don't be hanging on there. Well, not wanted to be a bummer. He goes and prays for them, and uh, he comes back to life. And then and they were about the young man alive, and where they were not a little uh, comforted. They were great comforted there. And so, again, he's coming there. And that's that whole thing. I mean, this is Paul. This isn't Paul or Saul uh, early on in his ministry. This is Paul. Now he's got some notoriety, not really fame, but just this is a guy that we can hear the word of God from. And we're not going to get that much time with him. So let's, let's get together and let's do these things. Let's, let's just take out of you and give us everything that you have. That's also was Paul's heart that he could be able to do those things. Look at verse 13. And he went before the ship and sailed unto Assos, uh, there intending to take uh, in Paul. For so had he appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Assos, he took him in, and to, again, to Mytilene. You see the journey there to Chios, Troigrillium, and Miletus. I got that one. Verse 16, for Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend time in Asia, for he hasted. It was, if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. He knows what's going to happen. He's going to get to Ephesus. 
He knows he's going to... He, he, He's going to want to hang out. You know that is. You know there's certain people you just don't want to hang around because you're never going to get away from them. I mean, you want to fellowship. You want to talk. You want to do these things. you got to read between the lines here, folks. He, he knows, look, I can't go to heaven. I can't do these things. He's going to call the elders over, and he's going to have everyone meet and says, look, I'm in town. Some of that, we've had some friends come in. We have people who've moved away. They said, hey, we're going to be in town. We're going to be at the cafe. We're going to be here. We're going to come in. Everyone wants to come. Just make it efficient there. Uh, again, traveling and going places and meeting people and those things, uh, again, you, look, this is where we're going to be. It's just, it just gets to the point when you start to know so many people, you just say, look, I'm going to be at this spot. You want to hang out? You want a fellowship? That's, that's where I'm going to be. Oftentimes people say, hey, come here, come here, come down. i like, look, you all live here. You can see each other anytime. I'm coming to this spot. Everyone who knows me, come here. Well, that's rude. It's efficient. I think it's rude that you don't go. I mean, if you want to see him, see him. Do what you got to do or spend the money to go fly halfway around the world to see him that way. I, I do that too. But uh, I understand that, again, we go into fellowship. So I know this. He's trying to get back. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. He's going to do those things. And so he's not going to go by Ephesus. You know, so he's a little bit of wisdom there. So he hangs out in Miletus there. And now we know that he's going to get down here. He wants to get that back down to Jerusalem. He wants to celebrate a feast there. Understand what the Apostle Paul is also doing. This is like his fourth and fifth missionary journeys. I mean, this is the stuff traveling around now. And what he's doing and what he's trying to do, because we know from the other letters, from Thessalonians and the Corinthians and stuff, uh, where he spent a few years, he's taking up a collection. He's taking up a collection and he's bringing it back to the Jerusalem church from all the Gentiles. That's why in Corinthians he says, set aside some of your income. You know that we're going to do this. So I don't, a great offering doesn't have to be taken. This is going to happen. You're going to see through what's going to happen through this practice and what's going on where we get like, uh, again, regularly setting aside some of your income. Tithing never stopped in the New Testament. They just redirected it. It was no longer a, a ceremonial aspect law of taking care of the temple that way. People were still giving. As we're going through the book of Genesis, you realize that Abraham gave a tenth of his portion before the law. So again, this hall predates the law. I was talking to a, a Jewish scholar, a religious Jew, a rabbi, and if you were with our study in Genesis 18, it says that Abraham set before the, we know that to be a, an Old Testament appearance of Christ, he set before him meat and butter and milk and bread. Well, we know that's not kosher. So I asked my rabbi friend, I said, well, what's up with that? Comes back with the explanation. Very interesting explanation. He says, well, uh, some scholar says that they were Arab travelers and it's okay for non-Jews to eat meat and dairy together. But some of the other scholars say, well, they were, they were angels, so they're outside of the law. And some of his other scholars said, says, well, what he did was is that he, because Abraham wanted to make everybody happy, he put out meat. And it took a course of a time because in kosher, in the law, you have to wait a minimum of an hour before you can eat mate or dairy and have in the same stomach at the time. It's got to digest a little bit. I said, well, it doesn't say that in Scripture. Well, that's how our rabbis have interpreted it. I just, this, they really run into the four and five course meals, folks. I mean, they, he said it. I mean, the Bible is just pretty clear. It says, but when you don't believe in Jesus Christ and Savior Lord, you can come up with a lot of explanations. And so here, verse 17, and from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when, he, uh, when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know, from the first day that I came into Asia, and after what manner I have been with you, at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humanity, humanity, uh, humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the line and weight of the Jews. Again, he's going to talk about this in Corinthians when he talks about you know being in uh, uh, in the hands of his fellow countrymen, he's being in perils and of dangers and these things. You you know what manner of life that I live. Take a side note. We know from Corinthians, we know from Thessalonians, we know from some other things. This is the Apostle Paul who was used by God to start these churches. And they begin to question his apostleship. The Corinthians, beginning to, he goes, I don't, I don't get this. I spent three years with you? I spent three years with you and you're questioning my apostleship? Because now others who come who beat you and rob you and do these things? And, and because I'm asking for money to bring back to the Jerusalem church, you're, you're questioning me? Here's the thing. Sometimes when people, and this is how you have to live, folks. I encourage you because I do the same thing. 
All right, two little, two little golden rules I'll give you here of Chick's. All right, uh, Chick's golden rules. I have, I have one, I guess a third, Chick's law of perpetual motion. If you move, you're bound to go somewhere. Uh, but basically, when the best way to silence your critics is outlast them. Second is that you work on your character and God will take care of your reputation. And so here's the thing. Paul's what he's saying. Look, there's all these questions. We're hearing about this. We're hearing about that. And look, it took a while. No Skype, uh, no Facebook, none of those things. I, I like when, uh, I don't know, some of you uh, youngins there, uh, sometimes you might work as a cashier and sometimes you might look down at your nose and you see older folks and I'm 49, I'm an older folks. And, and they ask you, well, you know, would you, can you bring your own bags? That's the big thing right now. That's the big thing. Can you bring your own bags? I had a cashier tell me, this, well, you don't have your own bags or your own box. I mean, don't you want to try to say, aren't you believe? You know, it's a green thing. We're all in the green. Really? We're into the whole green thing, right? You, uh, you say that this is a good thing, that, that we're into the whole green thing. You know, back in my day, we collected pop bottles, returned them to the store, got money back from them. They used those pop bottles, the companies did, washed them out, and reused them. In my day, we took milk bottles back and they washed them and refilled them. Yeah, but I know it's a green thing, all right? Back in my day, we walked. <laughs> we didn't get in the gas guzzling, fuel efficient, horrible flex fuel, ethanol, electric car to go six blocks. We walked. We returned cans. We did all kinds of things. Yeah, we, we did those things. Watching a movie last week and I'm telling my kids, and my daughter said, see that? They got all those kids together in 1970 without Facebook. How'd they do that? And then my daughter's watching the whole thing and says, the guy's calling. It's the movie We Are Marshall. And the guy's calling to tell his wife, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not on the plane. I'm driving you know, home, something like that. And then later the plane crashes. Uh, I don't want to spoil it for you, but if you're around 1970, you remember that. If not, that's what happens. I said, see what happens? Back in 1970, we had to, like, know your neighbors, call a neighbor, because you always knew old lady Gladys was home, call her, because there was telephone, telegraph, tell Gladys, and uh, <laughs> can you tell so-and-so? No answer machines. That was it. Well, Gladys sometimes didn't deliver the message. This woman thinks that... Her husband's dead. And then he pulls up in the car hours later. She's like, God. Oh. I said, see, that's what we did back in our day. There's pros and cons. The pros is someone had to take a message. The con is if they didn't give the message, they think you're dead. <laughs> but that's how it works. All these things. So we're going to recycle. You're going to say, what did you drive to get here to tell me to bring my own bags? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We didn't have a green thing here. We just, So understand this whole thing. Oh, we want to do So understand this, that Paul looks at them and says, look, you know the manner of life. Whenever criticisms come down, whenever there is an unforeseen church split, we plan ours every year in February, but whenever there's an unforeseen church split or someone comes out like that, and I, have, I often have people with a whole list of questions because someone else said something, I can't tell you what's going on and all these kind of sins. It's dealing with their own sin in their life, but somehow there's some secret thing that's happening here. You're having a good time here at church, but someone you care about leaves, and they can't tell you. I'm like, tell them. No, I can't tell you. There's just, you don't know what I know. And then people have this long list because they have access to me and my wife. I say the exact same thing. I said, I see your list there. I'm not going to answer any of your questions on your list. You have a decision to make. Either we're who we say we are and what you've seen us, and by what manner of life or you believe the things on that list? The decision's yours, but I'm not going to answer those questions. It's a waste of time. There are people, take this down, folks. There are people dying and going to hell. There's no reincarnation. There's no recycling. It's a fire thing, not a green thing. There are people dying and going to hell. I don't have time for your questions. Apostle Paul, you know by what manner of life. I've lived them. I've what do you think that you're seeing there? And the things that it causes you confusion is like, wait a minute, that just doesn't match up with what I know. Right. So there shouldn't be any confusion. And so here in verse 20, 
and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards God, Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that are going to befall me. Say that the Holy Ghost witnessed it everywhere in every city and saying that bonds and afflictions abide in me. This this is what I do know. I'm calling the elders. You've heard all these things. Let me answer the question for you. You know my manner of life. Either you believe it or you don't. I can't help you with that. But the best way to silence your critics is to outlast them. Folks, if we were, and anybody here, not just me and my wife and the family, if we, were, if, if we are not who we say they are, then people who might say who we say we are, and no one's really left. I'm, I'm not, there's nothing really going on. I'm just trying to just give you, we're coming across scripture here and stuff like that. Then if they're away from this fellowship, their life should be excelling in Jesus Christ. If this church, if the people here, you and I, we're holding them back, we're destroying them, we're wrecking their faith, causing them problems, then wherever they are now, their life, you should look back and go, wow, you were doing great things in Christ, you saw it like that, you got crusades, you got everything, go, wow, you, it really was this church. And you know what, sometimes it is, but then I get the privilege of maybe finding a church for them. Maybe it's just not working out here for you. Maybe I can get you another church because this, this just isn't working here. Fine, that's great. And as a pastor, I help to get them into a place where they have a shepherd. But if someone just leaves, shouldn't their life just be excelling? Here's the other thing. Every time you get together, if their lives are truly excelling in Jesus Christ, they shouldn't be offering a defense to you every time they get together with you of why they've left and whatever. I don't offer a defense of why I married my wife. I looked at her. This is the Lord. We got him. Yeah. Why'd you marry her? Well, you gotta understand. I asked God for a sign. It was a midget dressed like Napoleon on the back of a zebra, going down Robert Street in January. Well, one of the Januarys where there's snow, and uh, <laughs> I knew that was. I don't offer a defense. Well, why would I every time I get together with someone like I offer a defense of it? So I'm just giving you the telltale signs. Look, Paul gets the other elders together. You got all these questions. Look, you know by what manner of life. Here's what I do know. This is what the Holy Spirit has promised me. And again, he's going to travel these ways. He's going to go this way. And he's going to do that right here. And you see that on the map. Um, fundamentals and distinctions. We're going to go over to the last part of uh, this part of Acts chapter 20. And there's some fundamentals and distinctions that you need to know. We've already talked about and we will continue about the word of God, faith in God, and the love of God. And then, unfortunately... We're going to talk about the compromise of God. But again, the the Word of God, the faith in God, and the love of God, these things, you can go to our church website. We actually have some audio messages that you can look at, the distinctives, things that are just distinctives to us here at Calvary Chapel. Understand this, you're taking notes. Difference not wrong. It's just different. We're strange and peculiar people, right? That was the Bible tells us. We believe it here, all right? But there's just distinctives. And understand, different isn't wrong. It's just how we choose to worship. and That's what we do. But there's some things that are distinct that make us in like fellowship with one another. And so we go through here, the Word of God. Let's talk about that first here. Look at verse 24 of Acts chapter 20. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Understand this. How many of you here are called into full-time ministry? Very good. How many of you are Christians here? Part-time or full-time? Okay, let's ask that as a question. How many of you are here called into full-time ministry? Every one of you. All right, there you go. All right, you understand that? You're a Christian, full-time. Not a card-carrying Christian. I'll leave my card on the mantle, go out, do my thing, come back, put the wallet back. No. Is that we're all called. So don't look at the Apostle Paul says, oh, it's called his ministry and stuff like that. All of us are called to ministry. Paul just has, has to have a ministry where he gets stoned a lot with rocks and uh, he gets taken away and going to prison and do those various things here check out his resume see if he'd get a job uh, 
which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of grace. Look at verse 25. And now behold, I know that ye all among them who have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take to you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Verse 27, for I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. That is a motivation right there. We all have certain motivations. I would pray that verse 27 would be a motivation for you. Actually, 26, that you wouldn't be guilty of anyone's blood. But verse 27, based upon this, that I have not shunned to declare the, unto you the whole counsel of God. That's God's word, folks. That we haven't failed to give God's word to somebody. You and I possess and have understanding of all the answers of life and godliness. You and I. God's word. We possess and we have all the answers for life and godliness. And here it tells us here that, again, sometimes when we shun and we don't give someone the whole counsel of God, he says, you know my manner of life. You know I've spent that time with you here. So we see that word of God. Do not fail. Let the word of God, as Colossians tells us, rule in you richly as you teach and admonish one another. And that's not just relegated for the Apostle Paul or the super saints and all that kind of stuff. That's every believer. And so we see here um, that when it comes to the faith in God, Let's look at the various things right here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1-2. through 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye not be soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of the Christ is at hand. We talked about this last week, or you saw the videos, and we are talking about the rapture of the church, and there's some question here. Your faith in God. Your faith in God. And again, Paul's gone through Thessalonians. He's talking about, he's calling the elders from Ephesus and all over. And this is one of the letters that he's written to them here. Let me go on and explain to you what the deal is. Let me give you the progression. Let me give this whole thing. But your faith in God and, 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 and your faith in God can be, can be steadfast. You can trust God. You can trust him in his word. And again, this coincides with what Paul's been writing here. We see, a, a, again, a summary in chapter 20. But this is some of the stuff that he writes to these folks. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to the, all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made ye overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock also of your own selves, shall men arise and speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. This is, for lack of a better term, what I call Christian homosexuals. They cannot procreate. They can only recruit. You understand about the homosexuality and how abnormal it is? Not just what you can think of the thought that they do, but again, they can only recruit. They can only take from that which is established. That's also the same thing as the enemy. The devil can't create. He can only pervert creation. We even see that in Romans chapter 1. But don't be a Christian homosexual. <laughs> don't go and take from something else. Go and procreate. Lead other people to Christ. That's why we passed out and, and asked you to just pray for people on your prayer cards here and, and commit to prayer and lead them to Christ and have it, just be praying for them to come to know Jesus Christ. But understand this. Paul knows that after my departure, people are going to come in, the grievous wolves from your own selves. That's the one that hurts. It isn't the enemy from the out. I can handle that. That's the Brutuses. Et tu, Bruti. It's, it's the ones from within. That's the painful one. That's why when people show up with lists, what about all this? And I'm like, look, I'm not going to answer those questions. I'm either who I say I'm what you've seen or I'm a liar. Either way, you've got to make a decision and you've got two votes, two feet. Walk out or stay. I mean, that's it. If you're still here when I see you next week, then I guess, I guess you've made up your mind. But you've got to act upon that decision there. So again, your faith in God. Look, these things are going to happen, folks. So I'm telling you now, don't be surprised. But what do you have? You know the manner of life in which you've lived among you and what we're doing and what we're laboring there. We see some things here about uh, faith in God. We see some others. And I'll look at one here. One of my, one of my heroes is Keith Green, but he's with the Lord. <laughs> he's even more of a hero. He's with the Lord. He wrote a thing called the Catholic Chronicles here. I wanted to tell you about it. Roman Catholicism is not Christianity. Keith Green writes and uh, published these things called the Catholic Chronicles and uh, Last Days Ministries, his wife, his widow, doesn't even publish those things anymore. They've sided with the Catholics. There's people who've sided with ECT evangelicals and Catholics together where they promise not to evangelize one another. Does it, has anyone been in Catholicism? Do you guys really, have you guys ever evangelized? I mean, I have never seen an evangelism program. So basically, you've just asked the evangelicals 
to not tell the truth. I mean, you, you've neutralized them. We're not going to evangelize. I don't know of any Roman Catholicism. Well, I guess there was. They had a program for about five, 400 years called the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, I guess they can call that evangelism if they want to do that, headed up by the Jesuits there. And Keith goes on. You can read this on your own, but Keith goes on to write in these tracks here that he's not trying to personally, he's not, again, any Catholic, any person and stuff like that. But I just want you to know that I love you and I care about you and I want to give you the truth. And again, I, again, grew up uh, uh, really uh, in a cult called the Christian Science Church and I wanted to evangelize and talk to my Catholic friends that I was uh, uh, with and I ended up st- studying Catholicism. Wow! Unbelievable! What an incredible waste of time. And the reason why it's an incredible waste of time because then when I go try to evangelize or I go try to talk to my Catholic friends, they don't even know their doctrine. I don't show right here, but if you believe the Immaculate Conception is the birth of Jesus Christ, you are wrong. The Immaculate Conception is the sinless birth of Mary so she could be sinless to have the birth of God's Son. That doctrine happened like in the 1800s. It was kind of believed, but they kind of canonized it with Vatican I. And so there's a, these, are, these are the things that they've made up these decrees and stuff. And just like I've shown you with my, my rabbi friend telling me the interpretation of, of Genesis chapter 18, well, it means this, it means that. I mean, it doesn't say that he just said it all out right there and they did it. And so here, they don't do this practice anymore. They don't put this up on their websites anymore. Here's a website that you can go to and you can see these and download these uh, tracks and these, these things right there that I hand out. They're great. They're great information and basically what they do. What they do is they give the information about how these things came on. Folks, fish on Friday. Fish on Friday. You can never figure that one out. McDonald's did. Because <laughs> people weren't coming in on Fridays. And we got to get them in here. Because you just can't go get those fries. You want to get everything else. But we got to get them in there. Fish on Friday started with some nuns in a convent in France. So let's just help the local fishermen out. Let's eat fish once a week. Let's just do that for the convict. Got around, got around. Sort of a good thing, right? Kind of got around, got around, got around. Fifty years later, no one realizes why they're eating fish once a week. The Pope at that time says, that's what we're going to do. And he canonizes it. And anyone is, you know, and all of a sudden you're eating fish. Well, by Vatican II in 1963... The Vatican II Convention, they repealed that. You, uh, we kind of did a little research here, and oh, that really wasn't uh, anything God said. That's just something we came up with, and they repealed that. But still, you've got some people, I want the old Catholicism. I don't want to understand what the priest is saying. I want it in Latin. <laughs> right. I have friends like that. I've actually told him, he says, I liked it better when I didn't understand him. <laughs> so we have the Word of God, we have the faith in God. And understand your faith in God, just like with Catholicism and everything else, can be, can be skewed. But now let's look at the love of God, because they'll know we are Christians by what? By our love? Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5-7. through 7. It says, Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things, and now ye know that, uh, that what withholdeth he that might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth it will let it until he is taken out of the way. You want know, to talk a little bit more about the rapture as we go on in the weeks to come. But there's something restraining something and holding back the church from being raptured out. We know that to be the Holy Spirit in us and holding those things back there. But it is that love of God. It is that love of God. I like what Dr. Mark Hitchcock uh, said on uh, uh, Thursday. He said, you know, that, that whole thing about the, about the rapture and stuff like that. Well, what kind of evangelism is that? Hey, become a Christian and go through the tribulation. You know, what kind of evangelism is that? What, that, that whole thing is that. But the, the love of God, where's the love of God in all that? They'll know we are Christians by our love. So our love for God and love of God. We look at uh, verse 31. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. This is the things he's told the Thessalonians. These are things that he's told the Corinthians. And, and every, every, again, he's talking about the, the rapture of the church. He's talking about the love of God. He's talking about the word of God. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which was able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. This is what he's doing. Look at verse 33. 
He tells us, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. We know that, uh, that Priscilla and Aquila, and we know Apollos, they came, they were tent makers. They're like, Paul, we're going we're gonna to work and do something. We want you to go preach the word of God. Go do that, go do that. We're going to raise up, we're going to do our... Look, I, Paul tells them in the Corinthians, so look, I, you're saying I'm not an apostle because I robbed other... Ch- That's the term going around, I robbed... Remember, he's going around, he's taking a collection so he can go and says, look, we got a spiritual heritage because of the Jewish believers there in Jerusalem, and everything's happening here. Yeah, granted, if you want to fill in the whole story, they took quite some time to get the word to the Gentiles, but we're here now. Let's go and bless them. It's still started, and they're, they're, they're being persecuted, and it's tough for them to be there. So you're saying me going around taking up a collection so we can go back and bless them is robbing? Then Paul talks about it in Corinthians says, okay, I'll be a little foolish here. Yeah, I robbed other churches, by the way, so I could preach to you free of charge. Are you you upset about that? Are you upset about the free meal? When we do our various things like that and people were, someone's asking and arguing with us and like, what do you care? It's free. Well, you know, I can buy my own food or I get a free meal when I come here anyways. I was like, what do you matter? Still, what does it matter if I buy it or the place buys it? It's still free, right? Well, yeah. Be quiet. Why don't you close that Grand Canyon between your nose and chin? Just to stop. You just. <laughs> Do you understand? You yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. So again, he took care of his own needs and the needs of others. Verse 35 I have showed you all things how. How that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and they all wept sore and fell upon uh, Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing, most of them for the words which he spoke, that they said, See, that you'll see his face no more. And he accompanied him on the ship. Now we know the continuance of the New Testament there. We know that the Apostle Paul did go back. But understand his resolve. I'm going back to Jerusalem to die. That's it. I'm, 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 my face is set that way. I am prepared and ready to do that. You know, folks, it's a, it's a thing that you're prepared for. And that, look, as I say, people already, your family and friends already believe that you're Jesus freak. So just why, why hold them in suspense any longer? You know, just go ahead. They already have an opinion. They already have these things. Live your life for Jesus Christ. As if he's coming back today to take us away. Ha huh? But make plans like you're never going to die. So if you wake up tomorrow or later this afternoon, or you still have something to do. You're still about your father's business. You see, Romans 5.5 5 says, And the hope that maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, uh, 7 through 8. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now uh, letteth will let it until he is taken out of the way. There's going to be a great rapture of the church. There's going to be great taken away of the, before God's wrath, before his tribulation, before that 70th week of Daniel, as it's known. That last week of that this deal that's going to be made with the Antichrist. We're, we're taken out of the way. And it's only you and I right now through the love of God that is really doing it. So imagine bazillions and millions of Christians taken out. Who's going to be around to love? I, I, I beseech you. Go and research any hospital, any university, any orphan, or, orphanage. Find out any one of them that was started by an atheist or an agnostic. I mean, they might be ran by him now, but how did they start? How did Princeton and Yale and Harvard start? How did they start? <laughs> what were they all about? What were they, you know, they, now they have really small departments, schools of divinity, that's a really small relegated part of those camps. But how did they start? What presidents have gone through there? Uh, which ones start soup kitchens and feed the poor? Tell me, tell me one organization that has started by, by an atheist or someone who's an evolutionist who just believes it doesn't matter what tell me which one is it Hindus don't even do that because you're just going to die the sooner you die you're reincarnated you go to something else do your own research and find out those things so look the fundamentals are distinct as the word of God faith in God the love of God now but unfortunately let's talk about the compromise of God and how things Thessalonians 2 9 through 12 says even him who is coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders 
He's going to deceive, verses 9-12 through 12 in 2 Thessalonians 2. He's going to deceive that they would believe a lie. It's going to happen. And it's not that God is purposely going to do it. Look, you're going to believe whatever you want to believe. Whatever you're predisposed. And we already know this, even as Christians right now, even before you were Christians, when you wanted to have a cosign of your life or your sin, who did you go to? Someone who would tell you that you're okay. Someone who maybe is just doing the exact same thing. I feel bad about this. No, you shouldn't feel bad about this. Why? Well, it's all okay because we're all doing those same things. You will find somebody to cosign your sin or your life because you want to believe a lie. Romans chapter 1 tells us that you actively, and I've done the same thing, actively participate in the lie in denying the truth. Some people try to Christianize or have a soul cleansing and talk about that whole thing, about that thing that they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. I know many godly Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian scientists, godly of this world, but nice, morally upright people. You know, whether you like it or not, the Christian Science Monitor, they have some of the best reporters. Don't get on their theology stuff, but they're pretty much throughout the world, and they've got a whole world bent, but they've got some pretty good reporting on some of their stuff. Not everything. But, but understand this, that there, there's some good, moral, I've met some good, morally upright, atheistic, agnostic, evolutionist, believing people who have a little bit of care. I like that. Because when they do something godly or Christian, I said, who can I report you to? Is there a head pagan, agnostic, or an atheist? <laughs> you know, if Sagan the pagan was still around, I'd rat you out to him. You did something Christian. <laughs> because aren't they around there like, oh, so you're a Christian, huh? That was very Jesus-like. How do I know that? Because some of your family and friends have called me up to report you. That's always fun. That's always fun. I love when that happens. Do you know what they're going to do? Had one mother call me a long time ago. Just said, please. It happens every time you go to Israel. It just happened a few months ago. Hey, please, you know, tell them not to go to Israel. Do you realize you called the leader of the tour? <laughs> yes, could you please talk some sense into it? They listen to you. That's why they're going to Israel. <laughs> Here's the letter. Got to figure out who wrote this one. Someone is just telling me I, again. This is back in uh, September, and just saying, "Hey, look about the compromise of the Word of God. I don't want to compromise these things. I don't want to do these things. And if you find me compromising and doing these things and stuff like that, you know, hold me accountable to those things." And he sends me an email right away, and uh, I like his last line here. If you compromise, I'm just going to punch you in the mouth. <laughs> and I'm just going to leave. That's why I'm staying here. That's why I'm continuing to be here. What am I supposed to do with letters like that? I mean, this is the encouragement. And people say, you know, kind of middle of the wall, do something like that. You, you kidding? You see the groups of people that are following or keep showing up here? I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to do those things. I'm not going to do something like that. It says, that's why I keep telling you, as long as you remain the way you are, I am not leaving. Once you start watering uh, down things and caring more about what people think, that's when I will punch you in the mouth and I will leave and never come back. <laughs> Do you see any marks? <laughs> Pretty safe right now. You see, here's some things, folks. Here's some information. Look at that back table back there. There's resources and things. Read it and give it away or read it or return it so, so we can give it to someone else. But don't take anything off those book tables to give away as a gift. All right? Write your name in the book and lend it to somebody or borrow it to somebody. Lend it to somebody. And then your name's in it, and then you're able to go back to them later and say, Hey, uh, you got that book I uh, lent to you? I'd like to get it back. Are you done reading it? Oh. You see, if you just hand it to them, they'll never do it. But put your name on it and say, I want that book back. Have you read it yet? Uh, it gives you an opportunity. I'm just giving you a little tricks of the trade here, folks. <laughs> just telling you how it works there. You don't hand it to them. Be accountable for that stuff. And so here, here's false Christ. Does anybody care? By Warren Smith. Roger Oakland's book. You know, uh, years ago, back in 2006, Pastor Chuck read the, actually entirely chapter 11. I used to hand this book out to guys, warning and warning and warning. Went through a lot of persecution, and even Roger Oakland did. He's going to be in the Red River Conference there in, in March, along with Chuck Musler and some others. But, you know, he was heavily persecuted, ostracized. Uh, get out of it. We're tired of hearing this. 
I give the book out now because all of it's come to pass and then some. I say, look, I used to give it out in 2006 as a warning. Now I give it. I was like, look, this is... <laughs> I, I don't know if people read the date. Like, well, this is old news. Right. In 2006, it was a warning. Now it's just a cautionary tale. So these are the things. This is back there. This just came out this year. Karen Matriciana, Why Does the Gate and the Emergent Church. And this is resources and information that you can get built up and encouraged with, but it brings you right there to the Word of God. That's an event. Here's some things I'll finish up with. 30 years ago, you could not have convinced me in Calvary chapels. That's just what I know. That 30 years ago, you couldn't have convinced me that teaching prophecy in end times would not be a priority. It is here. Maybe that's because you don't know anything else, but you go outside the Midwest. Folks that I've grown up in the Lord with don't even teach prophecy or end times. They're just how to snuggle in the struggle now how to get by and all that kind of stuff like that. Do you know what Dr. Mark Hitchcock, if you weren't here Thursday night, get it. It's only going to be on our website for a couple weeks. But Thursday night's message by Dr. Mark Hitchcock. Here's the thing. What is absent in the New Testament? How to survive during the tribulation. We have all the answers for life and godliness of how to be here on this earth until we're raptured out. But the Bible is silent about how to handle the tribulation and how you and guys Christians are to go through it. Oh, there's some information for the tribulation saints. <laughs> You're going to get your head cut off and the mark and all kind of stuff. But there's nothing for you and I. 60% of the Bible, folks, is prophecy. How could you not teach that? Accepting pre-wrath rapture of the church. This is a teaching. We were over in England and the UK stuff. Unbelievable. Dr. Mark Hitchcock even talked about this on Thursday. That there's people who said, okay, you're going to go through the tribulation. But before God's wrath is poured out, well, they look at the middle of the three and a half years as that's when God's wrath. No, 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 no. The wrath starts at the beginning. It just escalates throughout the whole seven years. CC is being known for ecumenicalism. That's in other words, we just get along with everybody. You know, I just, you know, Catholicism not wrong, Mormonism wrong, Jehovah's Witnesses is wrong. Mormons are now being called Christians. Glenn Beck cries. You know, the ones who hassle me the most are the evangelicals who don't believe I'm a Christian. You're not. <laughs> and you're going to find that out when you don't go to Kolob. All right? When you don't get your own planet. And there's a whole thing. I'm like, where? Catholicism accepted as biblical Christianity. It's not, folks. There's people that I know who know Jesus Christ are in the Catholic Church, and they have a hard time there. But if you're praying to Mary, it's not biblical Christianity. If you're praying in Mary's anywhere in your prayers, besides saying, thank you, Lord, for saving a sinner like her, that she could have the birth of the sin, thanking God for that, that's about it. The only thing Jesus ever said, she'd be honored among all the other women because she had Jesus. That's about it. What a privilege and honor to watch your son be murdered right in front of the whole world. Oh, yeah, kind of a little different twist on it now. Catholicism is not, it's accepted biblical, it's not. Distinctions of what is Calvary Chapel is not known or taught. I'm trying to teach them to you, and I ask you to go to our website and look at those things. Pastors who have never been through the Word of God themselves or with Pastor Chuck, let alone their own sending pastor, if they were even have one. I encourage you to talk to Jonathan back there. He's gone with me to a pastor's conference. He can tell you about the things that he's seen there, so like that. I, I don't know. We would never send anybody out who hasn't been through the Word of God, at least with me, and also with Pastor Chuck. I've been through the Word of God with him live, in person, once, and I've gone through it five more times. I've gone through the Bible five more times through online and all stuff. And I'm going through it right now. I just read through God's Word, and I study along with him and other pastors and stuff, but there's the whole thing. It just keeps me going. Because I learned a long time ago, because I got saved in the 80s, I learned a long time ago that People said, oh, I wish I was around in the whole Jesus. I wish I could have heard Pastor Chuck back in the day. I said, you can. I can hear Pastor Chuck going through the Bible for the second time in the, in the late 70s, the early 80s, and, and the things that he said there. I can go through that. Go through the worship leaders who are not the pastor. Folks, I led worship today. But this whole thing where worship is gone, the worship of worship, where now it's relegated to the whole, you know, look... I stand before God and give account of the worship that happens here. Not anybody else. All right? I stand before God and give an account of my marriage. Before God. I'm responsible for that. I stand before God and give account of my wife and my children and stuff. I stand before God as a pastor of the church. Nobody else. I'm responsible for that. I might have people who assist me with the various ministries, but it comes down to me. Because you know, because you've done it. You know when you have an issue or something happened you didn't like, who gets the email? <laughs> Dear Pastor Chick, maybe you haven't noticed, but the person you have doing this, da 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 
So sometimes I'm like, well, what's that, what's that to me? Why are you writing me? Because you're the pastor. Oh, okay, so either way I'm going to get blamed for it, right? I'm going to get blamed for it. Let me offend you. You understand? Same thing when it comes to worship. Evangelism or discipleship not modeled by the pastor. All of a sudden, the minister now is, means you minister to the minister. Look, you know my manner of life. Have I ever talked about evangelism? Discipleship? I just want you to understand that, 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 that again, that, that's something that's not happening outside of the Midwest in a lot of the Calvary chapels. And you can hear it. I've had some of you who listen online to some other pastors like, you know, I've listened to this one guy, I've listened to him years, and something just odd about him. It just, it's all stories. The scripture's like a springboard. I'm like, yeah. And I go, well, you discovered that on your own. And I go, yeah, yeah. Some friends of mine are uh, talking to me, or, or they talked about some other big time Calvary Chapel guys, whatever you want to call them there, who've actually been taken off some of the other Calvary Chapel's radio stations. Said, hey, look, you've lost your message. What? Well, you have. Let's stick with the Word of God. Because isn't everything that we read here today, I have not shunned to give you the whole counsel of God's Word? Pastors not reproducing ministry, but empire building? You know, we, we're out about planting churches. I mean, that's what I see the Apostle Paul doing. You know, you can go to our distinctives. You can go to our website and listen to the audio messages about the God's model for the church. So we're not a homosexual church, are we, folks? <laughs> we're not just recruiting for mothers, right? It's not the shifting of the saints. It's daily those being saved and added, and then we, we reproduce, do we not? That's what you're going to do, hopefully, in, in February, Sunday, February 19th, with our annual scheduled church split, where you go and take off and see the other church and try to figure out which ones we planted and go and visit the other churches and see who's doing whatever and... And reproducing. Healthy sheep. Listen, healthy sheep reproduce healthy sheep. Pastors receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit the first time at a conference. I, I would just be I'm mortified if, if, if someone we sent out was not filled and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And there was no evidence. I mean, <laughs> how could that be? How can you be called to be a pastor? How could you function as a pastor without the power of the Holy Spirit? Then it's all left to yourself. And there's this new term, unfortunately, folks, this old and new Calvary. I don't like telling you these things, but maybe you know that who God used back in the 60s was Pastor Chuck to get this whole thing going. And he never imagined that there would be over 1,500 Calvary chapels now and stuff. When I first came into the Calvary chapels back in the 80s, that wasn't even 100. It was less than that because there was already a church split. A group pulled away and called themselves the Vineyard. And about 50 pastors went away. And overnight, the Vineyards popped up. And they got away from the Word of God and experientials and all kinds of crazy stuff. And But... That's how the vineyard movement or thing started. And so the, the thing is that now there's this thing, this old Calvary, new Calvary, this thing. Like, what kind of a term is that? I believe old Calvary. I believe in Word of God and baptism of the Holy Spirit and the function that it gives and power. I mean, this new thing is we can be progressive. So you can look at a book. we got these back here. You can get these online and stuff, the distinctives of Calvary Chapel. Understand about the rapture of the church and... These are the things that we're discussing. These are the things that we keep forefront because of the intimacy of the, uh, and the eminent return of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's the Father does not castrate the sons. Uh, the Father does not infantilize the sons. And I think that that has made for the development of very strong leadership within a number of these Calvary chapels. And uh, had Chuck Smith been more controlling in his leadership, then I think that the entire movement itself would not be as strong. If Calvary continues to be uh, sensitive to uh, those fundamentals, and I think they will be, uh, then I think it's going to be looked upon. In fact, uh, already is. By many, many people are studying it. I've, I, I've been interviewed by uh, several people from major universities who are trying to study, typically from depart departments of religion, and I. When they interview me, I just almost have to laugh because the issue, the issue is not what Chuck Smith is doing. The issue is what God is doing and the packaging he happens to use. He always puts new wine in new skins, I think. He doesn't put the new wine in old skins. And that's what I think the denominations haven't woken up to yet. It's, I think, going to be difficult to evaluate the place of Calvary Chapel in church history until we see what happens once Chuck Smith retires. Because... The place of Calvary Chapel is going to depend on whether or not, at the point of Chuck's retirement, these uh, different chapels become independent churches or whether 
they become a movement, a denomination. Probably one of the greatest weaknesses is that right now the, the spiritual uh, stability seems to come from Chuck Smith and eventually he will be gone from the picture and so it will remain to be seen uh, where the stability will center in after Chuck is gone. Now if they become a denomination, even if it's a denomination that is relatively free and open in terms of the style of leadership, then I think Chuck Smith is going to be known as the person who um, had the original vision, God inspired, that uh, gave birth to this denomination. As you stand back and look at Chuck, you know that he's not only non-denominational, he, he, like myself, he harbors even anti-denominational feelings because denominationalism has taken such a penalty in some of our lives. And it's ironic because that's uh, his, his biggest nightmare is that for Calvary to become a denomination in its own right. And I sit back and, and smile at God's sense of humor because Chuck, whether he likes to admit it or not, is now sitting in what's probably the largest denomination in the United States. And he works very, very hard to keep the pieces separate, unaffiliated, except in a spiritual sense. And uh, so I think that therein lies its health. Organizationally, we'd call it decentralization, but it's, it's deeper than that. And again, it's just responding to the spirit. What we aim for is not so much trying to take a fellowship and, and cause them to become a clone of Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa. More so, we're looking for, uh, we, we seek to fellowship with those who are already being moved and directed and sculpted into that, that form and, and people of like vision uh, by way of the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit actually moving upon their own hearts and upon their own lives and like they say, birds of a feather flock together. People of, of like mind and like heart will always somehow or other find, find each other, especially when, when God is the one that puts it together. So we're, we're not so in any way, shape or form ever trying to like franchise out our style of ministry or, or our type of church so much as Calvary Chapel is, as being an organism is always welcome to receiving other bodies and fellowships and people who are like-minded to us and like-hearted to us. On the other hand, if there is a splintering of the current fellowship of churches at the time of Chuck's retirement or death, then I th my suspicion is that um, Chuck may get a long footnote within the annals of American church history, but it will be a footnote that will primarily relate to the Jesus movement and the important role that he played in terms of uh, providing a church that people with long hair and uh, sandals and beads could attend. So I actually withhold judgment at this point. I think there's tremendous potential in terms of Calvary Chapel occupying uh, a very important role in church history, but it will depend a lot on what happens um, in the next uh, 10 years or whenever Chuck may choose to uh, step down. I tell you this because Pastor Chuck has lung cancer. Never smoked one second of the day in his life. He's got lung cancer. He's getting closer. Now, in the 30 years I've been within Calvary Chapel, I've been to three of his funerals. Uh, they were at pastor's conferences where it seems like they were giving these eulogies, and then he springs back to life. And, you know, he had a stroke last year, and years before that, he had about a foot of skin taken off his back from melanoma and stuff, and he just keeps coming back. So I don't know. This is like the Apostle Paul. Hey, I think I'm going to die. <clears throat> But just in case you don't, bring my cloak, bring those scrolls. I, I've been through this before, all right? Second Timothy, all right? But I tell you that in the sense of, and, I, and hopefully that would be the thing that you realize that I preach Jesus Christ here, and hopefully you've heard more about Jesus than you have Chuck Smith. And hopefully you've heard more about uh, uh, Jesus and the body of Christ than you have of Calvary Chapel. But uh, again, we're non-denominational. And, and, and you get together with other Calvary chapels uh, in Appleton. That's our big thing. We get together. Why? Because we're not a denomination in the sense of that there's no real head church. We don't have orders or edicts. I've never once ever heard a rule or an edict come out from Pastor Chuck and all stuff. He says, look, we're a fellowship of believers. This is, look, look, this is, look, God's model for the church. What we do here in St. Paul is what we do here. You know, you look at our fellowships that we planted in Fargo. We just have a version and burden for that. But yet you look what... What Pastor Seth is doing up there. You look in uh, Calvary North Fellowship up in uh, by Superior, and you, and, and you look at the the work that that God is doing amongst those uh, fellowships. And you do this. this is different, but we're still again of like mindedness. 
That's what we call about having a certain distinction. That's just what we want to do. I want to hang out that way. So we see here at Calvary Chapel, our ministry here is reach, teach, men, send. Others have win, disciple, send. Some people have, you know, worship God, love the people, do something like that, you know. Uh, some is eat, drink, be merry, tomorrow we die. I, I saw, whatever it is. Uh, but this is a fourfold philosophy. This is a reach, teach, mend, and send. And those words are, are, are clearative and definitive words. We're going to reach people. We're going to teach them. We're going to mend them. Why? Because you're broken people. And we're going to send you right back out, right into the fight there. And so we have this thing for you and I, folks. Uh, again, this thing, you can go down to the church office, which is in the basement of 1406. You can look at this back in 1994. It's a, the Calvary Chapel movement. And for lack of a better term, whatever. And, and there's these things. And, and I always tell people, man, do you see anything wrong with this picture? You look at this right now, and it's the same way that I would use the book, uh, Faith Undone. Uh, this is, was done in the height of like 1994. Just everything's happening, love and grace and mercy. And, and you look at all the fruits and evangelism and stuff like that. And you look at this tree and it's not even reprodu- produced anymore. Brother Robert Chardon uh, just made these and sent them out to all the pastors at that time. There's only a couple hundred at best. There wasn't even 200 Calvary chapels then. And, and you look at the various things here and you look at that. Are we still doing these things? Are we still involved? Oh, that's a bad thing. Go down to the basement, look at these things. But, uh, are, are, you know, is there salvation by works? Five-point Calvinism. These th- are these things being taught in our churches? And those things that we're not to be a part of. These are things that we look at, the bird's ears, that the, the tree grows and the bird's nesting in it. And yet, you know, is there sanctified by grace? Is there salvation by grace? Is there this humility? Look, I want you to understand something as we finish up here right now. Do you know who the fight is with? You know, and I was hesitant about sharing this with you because I've shared this with Lord. I've shared this at other conferences here in the Midwest here. And, but do you know who the fight is with? It's with the enemy. It's not with anyone. It's not with the person sitting next to you. It's the fight is with the enemy. And flesh and blood is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And we wrestle against whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you enjoy it or not, whether you agree with it or not, you are in a spiritual battle. You're in a fight. And you notice things after you became a Christian. Some of them even recently that things have happened. All of a sudden, I can't get to church. Things are out. All of a sudden, these things have problems. And I, I never, I understand that. I never had temptation before. I never really suffered anything of guilt until I became a Christian. I didn't like being a Christian. I didn't like these feelings. I didn't like leaking. I didn't like all this stuff. All of a sudden, I go, what's going on here? Pastor says, you're getting a conscience. <laughs> what is that? Well, you know, you're feeling guilt. What? So understand, do you know who the fight is with? Jude tells us, verse 20, But ye, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. 1 Peter 5, 1, The elders who which are among you, I exhort you, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God. If you're a man, feed your family. Feed your wife, feed your kids. If you're a woman, feed your kids. Do all stuff like that. Feed them the Word of God. Minister to them kids. Preach to the dogs. Do something. <laughs> You've got your family and friends and all the others. I went this Thursday and all the way to the nursery and all the way, I handed these prayer cards out. I want the kids. We're exerting. The kids in this room and the kids in the back rooms. You're all doing the same thing. Be praying for people. Hold these things around. Commit it to prayer. Be involved with that. Parents, your kids have got these. If you don't have them, there's some in the back there, and you'll be able to talk to the kids. Who are you praying about? How would how would your children be damaged if you talked with them every week? Who are you praying for this week? What's going on there? What's happening every day? How is that really going to hurt them? And then they come to Christ. But here's the thing, parents. Unlike me, normally 12-year-olds don't drive. Uh, <laughs> when your kids' friends come to know Jesus Christ, bring them to church. Oh, man. Really, would you like to do that in front of them? You want to go to church? Really? You know, the Mormons think they're Christians now. Can you go there? You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they got a really great works program. What do you want to go there? I mean, you want to go with us? Yeah, folks, there might be some effort involved. And so the thing that we do for you and I is this. The fundamentals and distinctives is the Word of God, faith in God, love of God. There should be no compromise of God. Hebrews 4.12 for the word of God is quick, and is powerful, and sharper than any double, uh, two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and the marrow. And he is even a discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. That's for you and I today, folks.